and welcome to this quarter's Capital Market Review. Today we're going to follow the same format we have the last couple of quarters. We'll talk about uh, the economy, I'll mention a few key points, and then at the end I want to talk a little bit about you know, what we may see over the next couple of, uh, couple of months in particular. This quarter, if uh, I were to uh, characterize it, it was um, pretty unusual. Uh, not only did we have a, a huge and very powerful uh, surge in the equity markets, but we had this uh, fear uh, that came uh, into the uh, bond market kind of late in the month of uh, June and uh, kind of derailed, in the short term anyway, uh, bond and bond prices. Uh, while I think that was probably a bit overdone, uh, it is uh, to a large degree kind of a, a hint as to what may come from the uh, bond and interest sensitive market kind of going forward. As I always do, I try to come up with a, a title uh, or theme uh, for the uh, presentation, and I thought it was apropos to uh, title this Independence Day as we did celebrate our nation's birthday uh, earlier this month. So for the quarter uh, review, we decided to call this Independence Day. And um, I, I think it's uh, meaningful from the point of view of 2013 uh, will probably be the year where we see some independence from the uh, Federal Reserve uh, stimulus program and independence from the standpoint of uh, austerity as well. You know, uh, the economy is muddling along, but it is muddling along. And it's doing that in spite of higher taxes and uh, uh, sequestration. It's sort of like, uh, and, and David Kelly, who's a great economist for uh, J.P. Morgan, he's, he's an Irishman and he always has kind of a, a way of uh, framing a, a phrase. He says the economy is a bit like a 12-year-old riding a bicycle with training wheels. The 12-year-old probably doesn't need the training wheels and the bicycle would probably go a whole lot faster without them. So is the same with our economy with the uh, stimulus that we have uh, presently. So this year may be the year that we kind of go it alone. Why we do these quarterly uh, reviews? We think the economy matters. Um, we think uh, ultimately to identify where we are in terms of the economy, look at various data points, uh, we may be able to uh, identify trends a bit earlier than consensus. I'm especially interested in this uh, only because back in 2007 in particular, all the while analysts across the board were saying how wonderful the economy was, the pullback that we were experiencing was very short-lived, it was a great buying opportunity. Uh, had we gone back and kind of looked at certain data points, back then it was hard to really understand which data points we wanted to look at, uh, we would see certain areas beginning to kind of roll over a bit long before uh, we had the problems we did. So as a way of protecting the assets a bit more, or potentially protecting the assets, uh, we want to look at these things and look at these uh, regularly. And uh, we do this because uh, we want a better understanding of where we are and more importantly where we're, uh, where we're heading. And we do this to kind of diffuse some of the news that we get uh, because the, uh, the financial news, those uh, talking heads, uh, tend to be the, the first folks to scare you to death in and around the bottom. And lately they've been a bit more of, uh, of the cheerleader and that also has me a, a little bit nervous as well. And obviously, uh, with better knowledge, we can stay balanced, we can stay diversified, and more importantly, we can stay invested. Without it, we tend to bounce around. Fear and greed take hold. We tend to get out when we shouldn't. We tend to wait way too long to get back in. And as a result, performance over a long period of time tends to be compromised. So the four themes or four topics I want to talk about this quarter is we'll focus on the U.S. economy. We'll talk about economic growth. Uh, we'll talk about where we are in terms of corporate earnings and what the expectation looks like. And we'll also talk about the equity market from the standpoint of is it uh, still cheap, overvalued um, in the long term or in the near term. Because of what happened last month, I thought it would make sense to talk a little bit about the timetable for higher interest rates and, and to that extent kind of recalibrate that timetable a bit. At least we look at it. And then the other topic is Europe and uh, how Europe uh, is going to look going forward, especially with a bit less austerity, a bit less government influence. And I think that's all really positive. The fourth category isn't really a category at all. It's more of a catch-all. 
uh, from the standpoint of, okay, well, what, what exactly is, uh, is next? Let's talk first kind of where we are, what we've experienced here since the, the last time we got together. This is a graph. We've used this oftentimes. Uh, we'll see that the uh, S&P is a bit higher uh, than it was uh, at the end of the uh, first quarter. Uh, you can see the little bit of a drop here, and my pointer, unfortunately, is big and fat. But right here, this little bit of a drop in value, um, that was uh, from Bernanke's comments on June, I think it was 19th. The market suffered about a 7% drop uh, very, very quickly late in the quarter. But as we can see, the, uh, the market is uh, still at 16.06 at the end of uh, June. It's at, I think, 16.92 as of the close today, so it's up again. Uh, and that's higher than the previous high. And we really started to get tremendous growth here, you know, once we kind of broke through those previous highs. Values today at 13.9 times earnings are still cheaper than they were at the prior peak. We still have potentially a bit more room to go. If we analyze the sectors of the S&P and kind of looked at what happened for the quarter, it was clearly a risk on trade. What I mean by that is uh, the lower quality investments, those investments that are deemed less conservative did very well. Those that tend to be more stable, those that tend to be less aggressive, really lagged behind. As an example, in the quarter, financials were up 7.3%. Now remember how scared everybody was with respect to financials, and still are. They're still talking about breaking up some of the large money center banks. Conversely, Energy stocks were actually down for the quarter, as were utilities and materials. Things that generally are a bit more stable, things that generally are um, less aggressive, did much worse. Consumer discretionaries, um, items that you don't need, items that you might buy because you want, did well, up almost 7%. But consumer staples, those things that you'll buy the same in a recession as you will in a growth market were barely up at all. So understand that a lot of the growth in this market has been from the more speculative, less quality positions. And we can also see that here. Small cap stocks generally outperformed large cap stocks, not only for the quarter, but you can really see the difference for the year. Now, how does that play out? Well, for many of us, if we tend to be more conservative, if we tend to be more balanced, our performance numbers are really trailing well behind the broad-based market. Uh, and that's been this way for the last two quarters in particular. Uh, returns are coming in, uh, and a balanced account is certainly going to have returns that are less attractive and will look quite a bit different uh, than an S&P if this continues. On the interest rate front, interest rates are still very, very low, but we saw this uptick late in the quarter, so that the 10-year Treasury is now about 2.5%. That's come in a little bit. It was a bit higher than that uh, earlier in June, that first uh, week of Bernanke speak. So yields have probably overdone it. We expect those to come in a bit, but generally yields are higher now than they were, let's say, last summer. However, that being said, real yields, which effectively is the interest rate less inflation, is barely 1%. The average is 2.5. So we're still almost a full percent and a half below real yield. That's a lot of movement to the upside potentially here over time. Uh, as a result, um, you had corporate bonds, which in, in periods of time when interest rates fall, tend to average about 10% per annum, in the S&P about 11. So in this case, you got the free ride. You got risk reduction by owning bonds, and you didn't give anything up in terms of return. In a rising rate environment, bonds average maybe 3%, actually a negative real return. And stocks, their return comes in a bit as well. But you start seeing this deviation, this schism, this difference in value. Fixed return yields also are all over the board from the standpoint that just because interest rates are rising doesn't necessarily mean that all bonds have to lose value. In our portfolios, we have very few treasuries which are most susceptible to interest rate moves. And most of what we have 
is either U.S. high yield convertibles or floating rate. And in many cases, those types of returns have far less sensitivity to rising interest rates. So we need to have bonds, but we don't necessarily have to have bonds that offer the same kind of sensitivity as treasuries or the U.S. aggregate. Uh, just looking at bonds again, especially for the quarter, and read that as what happened after June 19th, any bond, any shape, fashion, or form was actually negative. And you can see, with the exception of high yield, as I mentioned, that was the only bond category that was actually positive on the year. Why that's important is many of our clients are balanced, where we have a larger component of, well, we have component of stocks as well as bonds for a balanced portfolio because they don't want quite the same stock market risk. We're beginning to contend with some yield or interest rate risk. And that had an impact on portfolios and allocations. The S&P was up 13% year to date, but a balanced account, a 60-40 portfolio, was only up about four. And portfolios that were built with even more conservative structure performed even worse. So we're beginning to see where there may be a need for reallocation change, and also the realization that we might have to step up and take a bit more equity risk. And I'm talking about over a longer period of time, not necessarily today, next week, for reasons I'll mention in a moment. Let's go back and we'll talk now about the, the first theme point, uh, the U.S. economy. Stock market-wise, PE, we're getting to the point where the PEs are certainly not cheap. Uh, they're not overly expensive, but they're certainly not cheap. And as such, valuations are getting a bit stretched. Uh, I would not be surprised if we had a little bit of a pullback, kind of a summer pullback. Very expected, very normal, nothing that we would have to defend against or make extraordinary moves or reduce risk. It's just the market's gone way too far, way too fast. <clears throat> that being said, I'm more encouraged about the longer term. You know, we've gone through a period here where the market barely has moved at all over 13 years. Although, while this has happened, PEs have generally dropped from the peak of the dot-com bubble burst of nearly 30 times earnings to about half of that today. Entering these huge periods of consolidation, we enter with much higher PEs than we exit. We enter with higher PEs than we exit. So what you have are these periods of huge consolidation followed by a, a long-term rally of very high rates of return. Consolidation, high rally, consolidation, etc. So at some point down the road, we may in fact launch into that extended period of time. Um, all the while, most people are caught off guard because they sell out of equities or swear off of the market in general. Let's talk for a minute about economic growth and kind of where we are. As you can see from this chart, um, if you look at all of the uh, billions of dollars worth of uh, output that was lost during the Great Recession, we've got back all of it and then some. In fact, almost twice what we've lost. Real GDP growth for the first quarter came in at 1.8%. Certainly below average, growth absolutely has been anemic. The growth rates for the second quarter, which have now been reported and revised, look like they came in at about 2.2%. So for the first half of the year, GDP is growing at about 2%. Again, fairly anemic growth, especially considering the kind of recession we had. Expectation for the second half of the year is going to be something closer to 3%, and that should impact not only uh, equities, uh, but fixed income as well. And why do we expect better growth? There are a couple of reasons. One, a lot of the big ticket areas of the economy are doing just fine. Uh, light vehicle sales are tracking at over 15 million units. Remember, during the bankruptcy period, not that long ago, many of the companies, including GM, were kind of right-sized to make money, actually make profit, at about 11 million units. Housing starts are also improving. The trend continues. This little drop-off that we had here in uh, May uh, has uh, much more to do with uh, multifamily. Uh, this is housing. This includes single-family and multifamily. 
um, a lot of the uh, condo units, apartment units, etc., were slowed up. Uh, the starts were because of the uh, really wet, rainy uh, period of time. A lot of foundations were frankly just not put in on time, and it tended to slow things up. If we look at uh, shorter term periods, it looks like the trend is starting to continue. And the other issue is uh, real capital orders, capital good orders, um, are also improving, and they're actually above trend, and they continue to do so. In fact, if you look at uh, uh, business spending for the second quarter, business spending is, uh, is at a 15% rate. That is, the growth rate is at about 15%, which is really pretty, uh, pretty substantial considering. But unfortunately, you know, we can't invest in the economy. We tend to invest in the markets. And the markets are based on earnings, and the markets are based on earning multiples. So when you look at earnings per share growth, earnings per share growth comes from two categories, margin share and also revenue share. Uh, improvement in margin is a confidence issue, and revenue growth is actually the health of an economy. And if you look during periods of time of economic recovery, as we can see here, essentially almost all of the heavy lifting is done from margin share growth initially. And then it spills over into revenue growth. So what we've seen here lately is some improvement in margins. Margins have gone from 12 to 13.9. And that tends to be a function of improved confidence. Um, we're trending about 5% a year earnings growth at this point in time. And you can see here, corporate earnings continue to rise. The estimates continue to rise. The growth is starting to slow up, but it's incremental. And that typically happens as well in most recoveries. PEs are still higher than they were a year or two ago. But interesting enough, the PEs today, because of improvement in earnings, are actually cheaper than they were at some point in 2010 and certainly in 2009. So actually, even though the market is substantially higher today than it was three years ago or four years ago, PEs or valuations are a bit cheaper. And we're still below average. Uh, with current multiples of about 14 and expected earnings of somewhere near, let's say, 120, we would expect the, uh, the S&P to be about where it is today. The S&P closed today at 1692, and you'd expect the 14 multiple to be about 1680. Confidence tends to drive multiple expansion, and generally the growth that we're going to get out of the market going forward will be as a result of this multiple expansion. Markets are cheap still, if we look at it from a function of earnings yield to bond yield. The thought here is anytime you can take S&P earnings, 116, divide that into the S&P, you get an earnings yield. It's kind of the reverse of the S&P, I'm sorry, the reverse of the P-E ratio. And that's 7.2. Anytime that is more than what you would get in a long-term investment grade bond yield, it's generally deemed that the market is cheap, or at least isn't overvalued. And we are seeing, obviously, that the yields are coming down as the market's going up, but there's still a huge spread. And that spread today is every bit as it's been during many periods of time of robust market growth. So you know, we're not looking at an overextended market. This chart, I just wanted to show that generally, if you look at consumer confidence, which is this dark blue line versus the green PE line, it certainly shows that there's a high degree of correlation between rising PEs and improving consumer confidence. Anytime consumer confidence increases, generally PEs are carried higher. Conversely, as confidence wanes, PEs come down. So where are we today and what drives confidence? The four big things that tend to drive consumer confidence is directional change in unemployment rate. The lower unemployment becomes, the greater confidence is house or home price movement, stock price movement, and gasoline prices. Gasoline prices have been reasonably flat. They've been trading within a fairly broad range. But the other three, unemployment has been moving down 
slowly, anemically, but still directionally in the right place. And people are feeling a greater wealth from the standpoint of both home price as well as stock market price. So as a result, confidence has been improving, and that should help improve PE ratios as well. Let's talk for a few moments about interest rates. That's kind of the, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the room, right? Uh, that's probably got more risk associated uh, with uh, impact on bonds and in particular treasuries than um, stock market risk, at least over the near term. When you go back and look at that chart that I put up, which showed the 20 or 30 years of falling interest rates, and if the presumption is interest rates are going to go up for extended period of time, we would expect more sensitivity on the interest rate side of the equation. Everything kind of hit the fan at 2.30 on June 19th. Bernanke had finished his comments, open to a question and answer, and the catalyst for the disruption was uh, an answer to a question which kind of implied that maybe because of second half expectation for better growth that these unemployment numbers may come in a bit quicker than expected. Everybody had kind of calculated in their own fashion and form that the Federal Reserve probably wouldn't do much with interest rates until 2015. That was kind of the expectation. It would take that long for the unemployment rate to go from 7.6 down to 6.5. Bernanke kind of hinted that that may need to be recalibrated and we may hit that number a bit sooner. So everybody headed for the exit all at the same time. And it was well overdone. Prices are stabilizing, bond prices are improving a bit, kind of coming back. They're not going to come back to those levels that we were at beginning of June, but they should come in quite a bit from where they peaked uh, June 25th or thereabouts. I want to show you this slide, uh, which is the civilian unemployment rate at 7.6. We can kind of see that here. Um, why do we think the unemployment rate can come down a bit quicker? As you can see, you know, anemic growth. We lost 9 million jobs. We've gained back about 7. Here's the reason that it may come back a bit quicker. And it has more to do with demographics. Because of the baby boom population, the aging workforce, so many people turning 65 and retiring, some retiring earlier, we've got a uh, degradation in actually the, uh, the extended workforce number. That number, if you consider it a denominator, is actually shrinking, less people employable. Years gone by, 10, 15 years ago, if you created 150,000 new jobs a month, you wouldn't budge the unemployment rate. If you were lucky, it would stay the same. It wouldn't creep up. Today, because that denominator, workforce base, is shrinking, 150,000 job creation a month will reduce the unemployment rate by about one-tenth of one percent per month. So if you did the math on that, it could actually be sometime mid to late year 2014 that we see that number. If, however, things pick up a bit in the second half of the year, it may happen a bit sooner. Two things have to happen, unemployment rate down to 6.5 and uh, inflation tracking at 2.5 or better, one or the other or both. Uh, unemployment's about 1.8. So let's go back to this long-term interest rate graph. You can see, and actually this graph, if we were to extend back, we go all the way back to 1945. From 45 to 81, interest rates rose. That's a long period of time. 35 plus years. Interest rates have fallen about 32. They're now beginning to rise, although barely. If we get some degree of marginal rise, if nominal rates go back up to literally four percentage points higher than where they are today, over time we could see some disturbance. So some of what we're doing is looking at the bonds we own. We don't own any long duration. We would much rather take credit risk as opposed to duration risk. Credit risk is own high yield convertible securities, stay away from AAA rated because those are very sensitive to interest rate moves, and uh, shorten the maturities. I'd rather own a seven year bond than a 15 year bond, uh, or a bond that has a duration of six as opposed to 16. Those things help to reduce some degree of sensitivity. And as we can see uh, here, you know, when you look at the things that we typically own, high yield floating rate convertibles, they actually have negative correlation to the U.S. Treasury market. So as interest rates go up and impact treasuries, these things generally will have less sensitivity. This is just another way of saying the same thing.
And if you look at uh, in, in spiky periods of time, everything tends to move up, so it's important to control duration. That's really all this is saying. It's kind of a, a weird way to explain it. What happened last month was really a function of a lot of hedge fund managers trying to get out all at the same time, and um, a lot of folks got caught with very long duration bond. Here's bond land, and you can see the quarter, nothing was safe, as I said before. And you can even see an asset allocation bond fund, one that can go anywhere, is also down in value, in part because of the duration effect. We think that's a little bit overdone, but we think that is certainly tells writing on the wall. So what do you do? If you are balanced and you own bonds because you don't want to have that much exposure to stocks, you're going to see some headwind on the, the bond side of the equation. In the past 20 years, bonds reduced risk from the stock market and also delivered reasonably attractive return. Today, they still deliver freedom or guidance or help from stock market risk, but I think that they're not going to contribute a whole lot of return to the uh, overall portfolio. Problem is you don't necessarily want to get out of bonds to chase stocks because then the portfolio is way too heavily exposed. So at some point when it looks like the Fed's getting closer, we can put some hedges on, We can, uh, which many of you already have in your portfolio. We can also do other things from the standpoint of duration, but we don't want to get out of bonds because we will expose ourselves way too much to, uh, to equities, and that's also not a, a good thing. I love this chart. We're talking about Europe now. I think Europe is probably a, an outstanding bargain compared to where we are with the U.S. stock market today. I think the U.S. market is uh, going to do fine over the long term. I think values go higher, but I think we're a bit overexposed, and at some point we might see somewhat of a summertime lull or summertime pullback. Again, nothing to defend against. This chart is a PMI um, hot map. It shows number of different countries and month in, month out, PMI index. How you would read a PMI index is anything over 50 uh, indicates economic expansion. Anything below 50 would indicate some type of uh, recession tendency. Green is good, red is bad. So if, when we look at U.S. over the last well, since this chart was published, it's been green. Green is good. UK has been a bit more spotty. Look at this red area in the center. Most of that is Euroland, Germany, France, Italy, Spain. But a couple things to look at here, which is why this could be a leading indicator. As we start moving to current date, it's less red. In fact, it's kind of pink or blush. And we're beginning to see improvement in Europe. We're seeing France from 46 to 48, Italy from 47 to 49, Spain's now at 50, Ireland's at above 50. So Europe, according to this, may be very, very close to coming out of a recession. And if that's the case, that could really help from the point of view of portfolio performance, what do we do with equities? We're capturing greater value potentially in Europe. Now, the Europeans still think a lot of their growth is going to come from additional efficiencies, additional exporting, generally the business of business. And we think it's going to be less so. Uh, we think a lot of that growth, that improvement here in PMI is coming from less reliance on government handouts, uh, which is really helping to improve. Again, going back to the training wheel example. And the reason we think efficiency is going to have less of an impact in Europe these days is this chart right here. This shows GDP, or more importantly, exports as a percentage of GDP. And this light blue represents Euroland. And if you look as an example, UK, France, Italy, I'll just showcase those, you'll see that the lion's share of their exports are to other Euroland countries. So if everybody is in this kind of economic soup and they think that they're going to create more jobs, improve the economy by selling more stuff to their neighbors that are in the same boat, it's going to be a lot harder to have that happen. Germany has the highest percentage of exports into Euroland than anybody else. And that's one of the reasons that it's harder to break out. However, if you look at deficit reduction, or read this another way, as improvement and reduction in government subsidies, we're seeing marked improvement from 3.3 to 1.1 in all of Euroland. Greece went from 6 to 4. Germany nearly 4 to fractionally 0.3. 
three, France from three and a half to two, Spain from three to less than one half. Again, remember, Spain is very close to positive growth. So we're beginning to see those countries that are registering the, the best PMI are also seeing significant improvement in deficit reduction and reduced reliance on government handouts. That's a big, big uh, help. In the U.S., we're sort of seeing the same. Granted, the government's still buying bonds. We understand that. All this talk is when they start to wane from that action. But when you look at deficits and surpluses, the deficit on an annualized basis has essentially been dropping. We went from 7 to about 4% of GDP. That's the deficit we're running on an annualized basis. Obviously, each deficit gets added to the national debt. And then with Obamacare, it drops and then starts to slowly creep up again. This is based on the CBO uh, baseline. We don't know how much of this is true. Without the Obamacare and, and all of that nonsense, those numbers, the gray numbers here, would continue to drop and then flatten out. Significant improvement. This is a best guesstimate. We have no idea how much of Obamacare gets rolled out, how much it gets pushed back, etc. So because of that, Europe looks reasonably attractive. As you can see, current valuations are generally, in, for the most part, below their average. The diamond is generally below the brown bar, which is encouraging. When you look at PEs, almost every nation, including Euroland as a whole, is less than it is in the U.S., and dividend yield is a bit greater. So we're getting very uh, excited and encouraged about Europe and the percentage of European allocation to our overall equity mix. Emerging markets are more of a mixed bag. It's generally hit or miss. Many of the countries, Korea, South Africa, Indonesia, Mexico, way overpriced. India's got a lot of problems, very cheap. Brazil's got some uh, problems. European index, as a general rule, is, uh, is still reasonably cheap. But it's a bit more of a, a hit or miss. Emerging markets are generally cheaper than the world index, which is encouraging. But there's still a lot of influence here with respect to uh, what happens with, with China. And that may have a big impact on a lot lot of the Asian trading countries, which at this point in time are deemed a bit overvalued. So let's talk about the uh, catch-all, which I called what, what's next. Volatility has dropped off. When you measure the VIX index, uh, which is about 12 or 13 now, it was uh, 16 at the end of June because of the hysteria over bonds, but that has since come down. So volatility has been really dropping quite a bit. And correlation between the various stock markets and stock categories has also dropped off uh, a bit as well. Whenever volatility speaks, this peaks, correlation tends to peak as well. I think we're going to see a pickup in volatility only because it's been very, very low for quite some time. And at some point, uh, we're going to see the market um, react either negatively to the hint of Federal Reserve raising rates again. You know, that 7% drop that we had earlier last month because of the Fed, we've all made up every bit of that. So the market's getting a bit overextended. Asset classes, as I said before, the smaller caps have outperformed large cap. But look at the difference. You know, REITs, uh, which have done very, very well, are still through half of a year up five, uh, almost 6%. But that pales in comparison to the stock market. I'm not suggesting uh, that this is in any way the beginning of some horrible potential pullback. But you know, we notice very closely calls coming in the office. We've had a lot of calls about people, should we make adjustments because we're noticing that the returns are less than the S&P. Same folks that were very, very cautious about the market in general. I can remember a point where back in the 90s, um, we lost some clients uh, because the, the S&P was generating 20 plus percent returns for five years and nobody needed us anymore until the S&P dropped like a rock and then everybody got religion again. So um, I think we're a bit overdue. That being said, if we get a pullback or a correction, I, I think it's healthy. It will really help. For me, I plan on using uh, a pullback because it will actually firm up bond prices as a way to go back in and trim back a bit on some more bonds and replace with more equity. To do that at better pricing makes sense. I love this chart. Uh, this is annual returns and also decreases in a year. Um, as an example, the S&P is up uh, 13% for the first half of the year. We saw about a 6% pullback in July. Look at the pullbacks. 
These are pullbacks during a calendar year. The average pullback over the last 33 years is 14.7%. And there's absolutely no correlation between a 14% drop in the market during the year and whether the market finishes up, down, or sideways at the end of the year. Last year, the market was up 13, and we experienced a 10% pullback during the summer. The year before, the market was down nearly 20%, yet we climbed back to a 0% flat return. The year before that, we saw a 16% drop during the summer, yet the market finished the year up 13, and we saw a 28% drop in 2009, yet the market finished up for the year 23. Um, we think the market certainly has the propensity to see a greater pullback than what we've experienced so far, and that generally happens about this time of the year as we move into July and August. So we'd be using that as an opportunity to, uh, to reallocate. Best advice, stay balanced, stay diversified, and stay invested. Having more assets in a portfolio tends to diffuse a lot of big disruptions in portfolio. As an example, over the last couple of weeks, metals have started to rebound significantly, outpacing the return on the broad-based markets. You're beginning to see the inverse interest rate hedge outperforming substantially the broad-based market. So all these things tend to help diffuse risk uh, and stabilize returns over the long term. Uh, you can see a balanced approach never hits the highest highs, never is near the bottom at the lowest lows, and the returns generally are, are, are very strong over a long period of time. And that approach tends to be the uh, best approach going forward. The other thing is time horizon. If we're investing and we have a one-year time horizon, we're subject to a substantial amount of volatility. If this is pension money and it's got to last the next 25 or 30 years, you start going out and looking at rolling five years rolling 10-year, rolling 20-year periods, and you can see where uh, returns are far more positive than negative, and the, uh, the odds of having a very favorable outcome substantially better than looking at things over a very, very short-term period. So with that in mind, I'd like to uh, open up to questions. While we're uh, waiting to see if we have any questions, once again, we created a four-page uh, second opinion clients who have been kind enough over the years to refer others to us. If we uh, find that somebody is being referred and they would like a second opinion, we can deliver a, uh, a four-page report uh, that focuses on where they are in terms of retirement, where they are in terms of risk structure and allocation, and we kind of format it uh, more like a red light, green light, yellow light traffic signal. So it's a great deliverable, it's a value add, and we would love to be able to provide that to people you care very much about. So with that in mind, I'd like to make sure that I uh, let everybody read all of the uh, definitions, risks, and disclosures uh, that we talked about uh, today. This will define every little item that we've spoken about, uh, uh, treasuries, high yield, uh, bonds, commodities, etc. I'd like to uh, thank you, and uh, let's see if we have any uh, any questions here. One question uh, that, that we do have has to do with uh, turmoil in Egypt and uh, does that have any effect on uh, on the, the long or short term uh, with respect to the uh, the market in general? I, I think it, it certainly has some impact from the standpoint of news and, and, and focus on media but from the standpoint of uh, economic growth uh, not really. Uh, Egypt is not a, a major OPEC producer. It does have some impact from a social political point of view, from stabilization or destabilization of the region, and, and that has probably more to do with our uh, government's policy with others, uh, much less to do with uh, where we are as a nation from the standpoint of uh, uh, economic growth or impact on the overall market. You know, from a behavioral science point of view, any concern at all uh, certainly uh, uh, is something that uh, weighs on, on many folk. Uh, you know, Greece, Portugal, uh, the problems around their, uh, their destabilization of their economy has a bit more to do with uh, our economy slightly, only because Europeans own a lot of those bonds. There are very few that own Egyptian bonds, so there's uh, far less of a, uh, of a risk uh, there. Otherwise, if there aren't any other uh, other questions, I bid you a good evening. I'm always available. If you have any questions at all, please give me a call. Enjoy the rest of the summer. Have a wonderful evening, and uh, good night.